Warren Kinsella, lawyer, journalist, a Roman Catholic, a Christian. This is the holiest week. We're recording this on the holiest week of the Christian calendar. And Warren, I just wanted to give you a chance to talk about what that means to you. Uh, Easter, well, when you're a kid, it means lots of chocolate and and all that stuff. And uh, then when I got kids... Means to you. Uh, Easter, well, when you're a kid, it means lots of chocolate and and all that stuff and uh, then when i got kids i take them to the the beaches easter parade uh which is happening again this weekend and uh it's a little less gimmicky i think easter um should be than uh, christmas and it's about uh, renewal and uh, and rebirth and um, typically i put a tweet out saying um, you know, to have faith um, means to have questions, Charles, in, in my religion. To have faith doesn't mean just unquestioning acceptance. It means to have questions. And if that's the case, I am I am the most faithful person you can imagine. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, the thought I put out there, <clears throat> hopefully I didn't depress people, was uh, something along the lines of, well, I don't remember it was nothingness before I was born. I don't recall anything before I was born. My suspicion has been for a long time that that's what it is after you're dead, too. It's just an absence of everything. And um, so I depressed the hell out of people on Easter weekend, and I apologize for that. But that's um, you know what we're supposed to be reflecting on, and it's about the uh, about renewal and rebirth and uh, important time of year, an important. Uh, for their Muslim friends with uh, Ramadan and the fast and uh, Passover coming up for our Jewish friends. So it's, a, it's an important time of year. All right. Uh, Easter Sunday, a celebration of, uh, of resurrection uh, slash renewal. King, King Charles put out his Easter message, and it was about kindness. I wrote a column about it uh, for the Winnipeg Free Press. will be out on the uh, weekend. And uh, I'm all for celebrating kindness, uh, but I am cynical enough to think that one of the reasons He's thinking about kindness isn't just because um, it's Easter and and resurrection and spring and renewal and all of that. Uh, I think that he's thinking about how unkind uh, the world has been uh, to many people, uh, including uh, his his daughter-in-law, Kate. Um, I don't care whether you come at this from a, a legal point of view, moral point of view, Christian point of view, journalistic point of view, but uh, not just the Murdoch papers, but others around the world uh, taking a story of a woman uh, who had abdominal surgery, which was announced, uh, was not in the public eye for a long period of time, and uh, deciding to uh, create all kinds of trashy conspiracies, albeit I understand that you know she, they released a, a photograph that uh, wasn't, uh, wasn't genuine and all of that. But, I mean, uh, any intelligent person understands that if a woman has had abdominal surgery and is taking herself out of the public eye, is because yeah. something serious is going on that's very, very private. And at some point, she'll make it public on her own time and on her own dime. But the cruelty, uh, I think, is part of the culture right now. It's part of right-wing populism. It's part of journalism. It's a part of probably what we do. I'd be surprised if some cruelty doesn't slip into these podcasts. But I, I wonder, I'm Warren, play, if you could think about that. Yeah. I'm going to play devil's advocate with you. Sure. Because uh, I know what was happening in our newsrooms and i think newsrooms around the world we had a young woman who uh is in the prime of life <clears throat> who's having abdominal surgery in january and we're almost in the month of april and nobody's seen her so people were wondering what was going on there <clears throat> but the thing that happened charles is she manipulated photographs of herself and her family and she put them out there and she didn't disclose that she had manipulated those photos to the point where all the major uh, agencies had to pull the photograph because they decided that there had been deception. It, they, to some extent, you have to admit that the royal family brought the, this on themselves. When they put out deceptive information, for guys like you and me, our antenna goes up. What's going on? And um, so in our paper, we didn't engage in the speculation that the British tabs do, which always tend to be uniformly cruel. 
but uh, honestly, uh, you know, I've seen the piety since she made her announcement, and I hope she gets better um, and fights this terrible disease and, and beats it. But she did lie to us. And I think it was legitimate for journalists to say, okay, what's going on here? And, um, you know, and finally she came out with that statement, and it was a good statement, and feel, people feel badly for her. But she lied to us. Is it uh, legitimate to conclude uh, from what she did <clears throat> that William, her husband, must be having an affair with somebody? No, that that, stuff is, that well, that stuff's stupid all the time anyway. We've heard that about every single prime minister, every single prime minister we've ever had, <clears throat> except, I think, Kim Campbell, because she wasn't married. But, like, everybody, you hear this kind of bullshit. Every president, you know, and, it, like, who cares? Who cares? You know, so I put a tweet out. I put a tweet out supporting uh, <clears throat> some of what Nenshi is doing. Uh, he's uh, one of the uh, most uh, talented political athletes in the country. He's uh, running for the Alberta NDP, and I think he could give uh, Danielle Smith a run for her money. That makes uh, some of that story very interesting for me. I put that out, and uh, he's at a rally which he, where he fills the house in in Edmonton, uh, which was a substantially important thing that happened because he's based in Calgary and he's proving that he's got some support in Edmonton. It's a big deal. I put that out, and immediately uh, one of the uh, replies is, is it me, is it Charles Adler, with the oxygen tank in the front row? Now, all of this is water off a duck's back for me because I've been called thousands of things over the years. I do it for a living. I'm a professional. You get the same. That's not the issue. The issue to me is the cruelty. Uh, it's not about being cruel to me. It's about being cruel to the person, the good person, who is involved in democracy, actively involved, shows up, and yes, he's got an oxygen tank. Don't tell me that things haven't gotten more cruel lately because I think they have, and I think it dovetails with some of what we'll talk about with respect to the Ontario School Board and Facebook and, and all the rest of it. But the, the simple question here is, are things going to get worse before they get better in the area of cruelty in public communications from regular folks. I'm not talking about Donald Trump here. I'm not talking about Pierre Polyev. It's about regular folks. Cruelty. Yeah, and people don't like it. You know, these things have changed the world. And, you know, they made it, the good news is it's made it easier for us to get information, <clears throat> made it easier for us to communicate with each other. It's made it easier for us to do all kinds of things. But it's also made it easy for people to be anonymously cruel. Usually those go hand in hand. So uh, I'm going to just clear my throat. So, um, but some people are taking action. Um, just yesterday, all of the major school boards in the province of Ontario announced a lawsuit against Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Snapchat. And the lawsuit is for billions and they're taking the position that those platforms have marginalized and hurt children, made it difficult for children to learn, but also created an, a, an environment of cruelty that's never existed before in human history, not to this extent, and they want damages for it. And um, it's gonna be a very tough lawsuit because you gotta prove, as you know, what lawyers call, um, uh, based a causal connection uh, between the harm and the damages that's gonna be hard to do and of course you know these platforms are going to hire the best lawyers you you can get and they're going to rag the puck through the courts as long as they can but i think people are saying finally we got to take steps and even the right wing is doing it like you know that asshole abbott in um, Texas is doing something. DeSantis this week said, we don't want your kids having a social media platform under the age of 14. God help them in, in enforcing it. I don't know how they're going to enforce that. But I think on both the right and the left, there's a recognition that something has to be done. The House of Representatives a few days ago, uh, Democrats and Republicans said, if TikTok does not change its ownership structure, because it's headquartered in the People's Republic of China, and terrible things are coming out of TikTok aimed at democracy and at people, then 
they're going to ban TikTok in the United States. So I think people are taking action. So I guess apologies for the long answer to a um, short question. But the second part of your question, is it possible that things could change? I believe so. I think that people are now saying enough is enough. No need for apologies. Uh, you know, this isn't an interview. This isn't one of those sterile press conferences in Ottawa or Washington. This is a, a conversation between uh, two uh, professional conversationalists. So, Warren, the next question becomes, I think everyone listening is asking, um, are you confident that we're going to be sucking cruelty out of the culture? Or do you think that it's much more likely that cruelty, which is way too cool right now, is going to become even more cool? Well, cruelty is like racism. You know, it's like Christ's tension. It's hard for them to dominate the discourse. And so these things uh, and the internet help them do that. So for no cost, they could globally be cruel on, on an immediate basis. That's never happened before in history. So that's empowered them. So yeah. we're seeing that with the convoy occupiers in Ottawa. We're seeing that during COVID, the attacks on doctors and nurses, and people just say, hey, I'm happy I just got a vaccination. And now we're seeing it with the attacks on Jews. Like, it's it moves around this cruelty. It shape shifts, but it has been licensed by the new technologies and made easier to do by the techno new technologies. So there's no need for me to get into names, but whether it's on social media or in real life now, I'm noticing people who are, I would say, total amateurs at doing snark, doing satire, lampooning. They're just regular folks. And it just seems to me that they're trying to be cruel. They're faking it to some extent because cruelty has become part of the discourse, part, part of the language. And I, I think that if, if, if leaders were to come out and say, you know, it's no longer cool, I think it would give these people a break. I'm talking about some of them are young and some are middle-aged, but this this idea that the only way you can participate and be noticed is to be cruel is something I'd love to say goodbye to in 2024, but I'm not. I'm, I'm just not optimistic that we can do that. No, it's become part of the lingua franca. It's become part of the discourse. It's become acceptable. A racist, sexist, rapist was elected the most powerful man on the planet in 2016. That remarkable achievement happened because he perfected cruelty, right? There's a lot of angry people out there. There's a lot of cruel people out there. And he spoke to them. He connected with them. He said, look, I'm going to say whatever we're all thinking. No boundaries, no limits. And... Um, it, it's become a powerful force in society. It's unchristian, to get back to the theme of this weekend. And um, uh, we, we need to wrestle it to the ground. I was with uh, some Jewish friends this week, and we were talking about this, and they were just despairing of what they are seeing. You know, attacks on synagogues and schools where little Jewish kids go, and Jewish delicatessens and houses in Winnipeg being shot up and firebombed. And I said, well, we got to get to work and it's not going to be easy, but we have to push back as a society because if we don't, we will lose society. We will lose civilization. It's that big. So on the, on the piece of uh, Trump, uh, he's having to raise money because he owes hundreds of millions of dollars for lawsuits. And it just seems that mo most of the time he's uh, campaigning uh, to, 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 to make as much money as possible to uh, to pay off um, the various fines, the bonds. Once again, I, I don't want to get into all the details of the various court, court cases. He's uh, got uh, 81 uh, counts, uh, criminal counts against him right now, and then he's got all the civil business to, to deal with. The point is he, he's having to spend a lot of money on lawyers, so he's raising money. One of the ways he's raising money on the uh, holiest week in the Christian calendar, to revert to that for a moment, is selling Bibles for about uh, $60. He says he wants to make America pray again. And there is some evidence that uh, he is succeeding in selling Bibles to Christians. Please explain to me from a Christian perspective how a any Bible-believing Christian could see Donald Trump as a fellow. I, I, I get that they, the fundamentalist Christians and others want Donald Trump to be appointing judges to make sure that judges rule the way they want. 
various social conservative issues like abortion. Man, I understand the utilitarian aspect of it, but I'm talking about a Bible-believing Christian actually wanting a Bible signed by Donald Trump. That seems over the Christian top to me. Yeah, because they're fucking morons. <clears throat> they're idiots. They're fools. And we've seen this <clears throat> with the depth of support he's got with evangelical American Christians. Like, even after, you know, the Access Hollywood tape came out about with him saying he wants to grab women, has we grab women by the pussy, as he put it. And, um, you know, that he was found liable for raping a woman and has been credibly associated with multiple sexual assaults. They've stayed with him. <clears throat> Those people are not Christians, in my view. They may use the name. They may style themselves as such, but they're not Christians. They would say, well, Warren, you know, the principle of Christ is, um, you know, forgiveness. Turn the other cheek. Always forgive. Always forgive. And that is true. Christ did say that. But Christ also said to have judgment and to possess critical faculties and to assess, right? Certainly treat your neighbor like you'd like to be treated yourself, but don't be stupid. And <clears throat> these people, in my view, are stupid. So if you buy a Bible from Donald Trump, maybe somebody wants to sell it <clears throat> on eBay one day for four times as much dough. So maybe that's the motivation. But anybody who believes that that son of a bitch adheres to even one Christian principle is on drugs. They're out of their minds because he does not. Rent uh, is a situation that's uh, becoming uh, more and more difficult in this country, uh, especially for millennials. The percentage of uh, increases in rent and uh, mortgage payments, for that matter, has gone up uh, much more in the last uh, 10 years uh, than at any uh, previous uh, time. I, I could be out by a a follicle and a syllable, it doesn't matter. Basically, rent is going up at a faster rate now than it has been before, and therefore millennials are, are taking it in the chin, and they're the ones who are uh, most reactive to it. Obviously, that creates a problem among many uh, for the Liberal Party because uh, millennials are the largest demographic, and if the millennials uh, go against you, it's kind of over. Uh, the polls do say at the moment that it looks like it, it's over uh, for, the, uh, for the Liberal government as soon as there's an election. What about this idea, though, of uh, the uh, Prime Minister this week talking about a rental bill of, of rights? I mean, when you're talking about rental rights uh, and, and, and all of that, you're talking about something legal. Do you have any sense that the legislation is coming up, that this is actually something along the lines of charter of rights? Or is this uh, much more of just a, um, a, a, a political football? It's a political game. He's calling it a renter's bill of rights. It's like, hey, why don't you call it a charter of rights while you're at it? Like, he can't do this. No prime minister can do this. Rental, renting, renters are exclusively, completely the jurisdiction of the provinces and below the provinces, the municipalities. The federal government has no power whatsoever in this way. And he's saying, well, we're going to develop a national standard lease agreement. Every single province and territory, Charles, has already got a standard lease agreement. He said he's going to require landlords to dis disclose an apartment's pricing history. That's the responsibility of provinces. And, and he says he's going to create a fund for legal aid so you can go after your landlord. And again, the provinces already do that. This is an election year stunt. Historically, you know, New Democrats, and you and I know this, you in Winnipeg and me in Toronto and Vancouver, New Democrats always zero in on the rental voter, right? Because that's their voter. And they pay attention to this at the municipal and provincial level, and they should. They're right to do so. They have the jurisdiction. They've got the legal presence that requires them in that space. The federal government does not. And so along with being dishonest, my objection to this is it is an election year in Quebec. You and I have also lived in the province of Quebec. The party that is number one with a bullet, it's a Parti Québécois, separatist party. It is kicking the ass of the CAQ, who is currently the government, and uh, the Parti Québécois is going to form the next government. Doing something like this, a stunt that is so provocative to the provinces, you know, forget about the carbon tax thing. 
that he's got everybody mad about, at, about as well. This is setting off a firestorm in the province of Quebec. And I do not understand why he's doing it because the one province where he's still competitive is Quebec. It's just silly, absolute nonsense. So uh, take me to Quebec. Uh, you were born in Quebec. I was, uh, when I was brought to Canada, I was raised in, in, in Quebec before I moved to Ontario and then Western Canada. Uh, so we both have, uh, you know, our history uh, with Quebec. It's not very difficult for us to to figure out uh, uh, why people are crazy for the CAQ for about a decade, then they move on, just as they are in Canada. They're crazy about the Conservatives for a decade, then they move on. Crazy about the Liberals, they move on. It's kind of the way Canadians and, and Quebecers uh, play the game after a while. No matter what you're doing, you get put in the penalty box. But... My question is about the intersection of uh, Parti Québécois politics and Bloc Québécois politics, because I, I'll always maintain that uh, the Liberals' chief opponent in the province of Quebec is not uh, the Conservative Party, which has absolutely no provincial base. There is no provincial Conservative Party. And to the extent that uh, the Conservative Party is, is organized in Quebec, uh, they're only organized in a, a few ridings, primarily in the Quebec City area. So the Conservative uh, cause, if you will, and in, in Quebec, for the most part, is the Bloc Québécois. Does the Bloc Québécois gain power for a federal election if the Parti Québécois is already in power? Does it help or hurt uh, the Liberals' chief opponent in Quebec? It's happened before, you know, where the Parti Québécois has been in power and the Bloc has been surging. And we certainly saw that when the Conservative Party blew up uh, in the Mulroney years. Uh, I mean, I know he had some overlap with Charest, and the Parti Liberal in the province of Quebec. But, you know, they're like the NDP, the Bloc and the Parti Québécois. They're, they are expressions of each other. Like uh, the New Democratic Party in Alberta is actually formally connected to the national New Democratic Party, which makes for some interesting dinner conversations, I can tell you. So, um, but they're back for the reason you just cited. You know, the CAQ and Legault have been there for a long time and people are sick of his face. And so whenever an election takes place in Quebec and you have a Federalist Party in power in Ottawa, which is always the case, you get nationalist stunts being made. And I think that's what we can expect in in the next while. So the attack on Concordia and McGill and making it impossible for them to survive. You know, nationalists love that in, in Quebec. So <clears throat> this, one of my big work, you know, I stay awake at night and I, I don't sleep. I worry about you and my kids and I worry about everything. Thank one you, of my worries is, because, <clears throat> if you, you know, all the polling came out this week. This is another of my worries. Like Main Street, who I don't take seriously, but said Polly has 20 points ahead. Nano says it's 15. Abacus said it was 18 points ahead. It's probably around 16 or 17. Anyway, you slice it, it's a big win. I do not, the question that I would love to ask Pierre Polyev, and they'll never, never let me close enough to ask, <laughs> oh. what, what, Pierre, is your plan for surging nationalism and a partsy Quebecois majority government in the province of Quebec? What is your plan for them when they start musing, as they inevitably do, about another re referendum. I know that's not popular in Quebec right now, but you and I that know that can turn on the dime. They just need some yeah. provocation, and then suddenly we're in it again. What is Pierre Pelleyev going to do about that? That, to me, is an existential question for the country. I, I actually think, even though I don't like Trudeau, I think Trudeau's better on that file than Pelleyev will be. Well, Trudeau is exponentially better on that, and I don't want to pretend that just because I haven't been based in Quebec for a number of years that I don't get Quebec. If there's anything I get in this country, it's Quebec. If there's anything I get in this country, it's how to increase the pro-separatist vote. When people tell me separatism is dead, that's the most ridiculous thing in the world. It gets benign for a while, but the tumor is still there, okay? Here's the point. If I'm a separatist in Quebec, I'm not talking about just being a nationalist. I'm talking about pulling it right out of confederation. If I'm a separatist in Quebec, I'm loving the idea of a prime minister, Pierre Polyev, for sure, all day long. An Anglo from an Calgary. Ottawa suburb, right? Well, he's from and, Calgary, but in any you case. Know, I, I am born in Calgary, born yeah. in Foothills Hospital, like Ted Cruz, by the way. And um, like he... Uh, 
Yeah, and it's not fair to him. You should be able to speak for the country from wherever you are. But it's easier for Trudeau to confront that because he's so effortlessly bilingual and he really is bicultural, right? It's very hard to dispute that, that Trudeau does not know French Quebec. You know, he does. And he's good at it. And his seat count reflects that. And so when he's out of the picture, as I believe still he will be before the next election, you know, and if Polyev wins, as I believe he's going to, to whatever extent, like he's the parts of Quebecois, he's their dream. He is their Absolutely. dream opponent. Because one of the other problems about the guy is he expresses himself in absolutes all the time. Like yeah. there's no nuance with Pierre, right? It's black and white. And it gets back to that first question you asked about, you know, with cruelty and, and, you know, being kinder to people and just cooling it a bit. We're heading into a period where it's not going to be cool. It's going to be hot all the time. And in the Quebec file, that doesn't help. So let me just translate how a lot of nationalists and how people who are for separatism uh, and, you know, and just people who are Quebecois period, they see Polyev as churchy. They don't, they don't care that he's not personally all that religious. They know he counts on a really religious vote. There is no place in North America that's more anti-religious than Quebec. Now, and that will yeah. always be held against the conservatives. It was held against Harper. But Pierre Polyev, uh, Pierre Polyev, plays to a, a, a much more religious crowd. And that is something, whether people agree with that fact or not, there's enough there. There's enough truth in that uh, for the for the separatists. So, yes, uh, there, there's no doubt about it that uh, that uh, Justin Trudeau uh, connects with all of uh, Quebec, that Pierre Polyev connects with only a few slivers of it. And Pierre Polyev is a, a dream come true. If you're a separatist and you're thinking Pierre Polyev could have a majority, uh, that would uh, start next year. Uh, the Parti Québécois will be well ensconced. The Bloc Québécois will be well ensconced. There will likely be some issues that are brought up that are socially conservative. Every time that happens, it'll move the needle for the separatists. So I'm not saying that Quebec will separate. I'm not trying to hype it. I'm just saying that if you're a separatist, you want a conservative prime minister who comes from Calgary uh, in Ottawa uh, that counts on a religious conservative the base. Uh, Warren, uh, we've only got a, a few seconds left here. If there's anything at all that, that you want to say uh, to people on Easter Sunday, if you've got an Easter message that you can compress into 45 seconds, Father Warren, do it now. Happy Easter. Happy Ramadan. Happy Passover. Uh, it's a pretty good country. Um, we all agree on that. We get some pretty good people here. Let's all be a bit nicer to each other and pray that we have a more peaceful world going forward. And for most people who are listening to this and not watching this, I want you to know that Warren today is not wearing his collar. He's being very multicultural. <laughs> He's being very tolerant. He's being very Christian. But I got St. Joan around my neck. I always have St. Right. Joan around my neck. Blessings, Warren Kinsella. Thank you. Thanks, man.